Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I'm delighted we're speaking to a member of the Tough Girl tribe, Charlene Gibson, the oldest British woman to summit Choi Oyu in 2016. During this podcast, we learn more about Charlene's journey, how she first started getting into trekking and how that evolved into mountaineering. Charlene shares with us stories from the Everest Marathon, rally driving from Plymouth to Dakar, as well as summiting Mirror Peak. Hi, Charlene. Hi, Sarah. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Not too bad. How about yourself? Fabulous. Now, where is that accent from? Well, the accent is from about 15 miles south of Glasgow. Um, but I actually live down south. I live in, uh, well, I not live in Wiltshire near Salisbury. And I've lived down in the south of England for most of my adult life, but the accent never changes. Oh, I love it. It's amazing. So, Charlene, introduce yourself and tell everybody just a little bit more about you. Well, um, I'm now 51 years old. I grew up in Scotland for most of my formative years. Um, I moved down south to Kent in, uh, when was it now, 1988, so I was 22, and I joined the civil service. Um, as a child, I was not particularly outdoorsy. I l- liked to read an awful lot, and I, I'm an only child, so I didn't have any siblings to, to fight with, and uh, I didn't really go out and play with the kids in the street much either, because it's quite a rough area. Um, and uh, yeah, since since about um, well, about 2000, I've uh, I started trekking and um, and eventually have uh, turned to mountaineering because it was the the logical step. So uh, so I've turned into this outdoors person, and my mother just can't understand what has happened to me. Oh, do you know, I love it. And I can't wait to hear all about your treks and the mountains that you've climbed, um, because I know it's going to be absolutely fascinating. But let's just go back to, so you said you weren't outdoorsy as a child. Was, was sports, did, when did sports start to play a part in your life or, or fitness? You know, when did, did a change take place at any point? Well, at school, I absolutely hated PE. Um, I did everything I possibly could to get out of it. Um, I was very, very skinny. I'm still quite skinny now, but not as much. And uh, so I used to get teased an awful lot. And um, and yeah, I just I really wasn't sporty at all. Team games I really struggled with. Things like netball, hockey. Hockey was always in the winter. It was always freezing cold. Absolutely hated it. And um, and then it was. I think it was in my probably in my early twenties. And uh, my boyfriend at the time was quite a keen cyclist. So I started doing a bit of cycling and uh, and we ended up doing quite a bit of mountain biking and I quite enjoyed that. But I still I still wouldn't really have put myself as being particularly outdoorsy, even though we, we went and we did a bit of camping and things. I still quite liked the, the home comforts. So, um, so yeah, so I, I really, really wasn't particularly um, roughy tufty at all. So how did that change then? How did you when did you go on your first or when would you call yourself outdoorsy now? Um, I am a bit more, um, I still like my home comforts, but, um, no, what happened was, uh, that boyfriend and I, after 12 years, uh, we decided to go our separate ways and it was all very amicable and everything. So there was no problem there, but, um, I decided that I really didn't want to spend Christmas and New Year alone. And, um, so I'd, uh, I'd heard a few people talking about, you know, sort of trips with some of the the companies that do the the adventure travel um, side of things. So I thought, I'm going to book up one of those trips. So I did. And um, I booked up with one of the the sort of standard standard companies. And I went to Morocco for two weeks, trekking in the Jebel Saro area. And um, that was such a shock to my system because I'd never I'd never been anywhere like that because it's it's not that far away, but it's very, it's very, very different to here. And um, when I got there, um, even the the hotel was completely different. You had people sleeping in the landings and the stairs and things like that. And Marrakesh was just an absolute assault in the senses. And my first, uh, my first experience of a squat toilet was um, apparently something to behold as well. And then when we were actually out in the trek, I'd only ever stayed in proper campsites which did actually have even basic toilets this had absolutely nothing we got handed a box and got told to take a a plastic bag out of it and the plastic bag contained a toilet roll 
and a box of matches. And this was there was no facilities. We had to to burn our toilet paper because the area was so arid. Everything else would de- decompose, but the toilet paper wouldn't. And at that point, I thought to myself, "What have I done?" And uh, but I got through the two weeks. I really, really enjoyed it, and um, and that was it. I was absolutely hooked. So I booked up my my next trek, and it just went on from there. Do you know what I think is really interesting is, you know, you went through this separation after 12 years together with somebody and, you know, very amicable, which is great. But actually, it's that difficult thing of Christmas and New Year and spending it alone, which could be, you know, incredibly challenging time of year. Were you nervous about taking this step or were you quite confident to to go on holidays by yourself? Had you ever been away before on your own? Nope, this was the first time. And uh, yeah, I was incredibly nervous. Um, I had I, some people at work had had gone on similar sort of holidays, so I, I spoke to them and they said about you know it's usually a group of between twelve and sixteen people. You do get a, a few couples, not that many, and it's usually it's usually single people. Either the partners aren't interested in going on treks, or else it's people who are actually uh, just single, and they uh, they decide to go on a, a group holiday. And when I got there, there was I think there was actually sixteen of us on on that trek, and it was quite a there was quite a variety of ages, experience, um, fitness levels. I mean, to be fair, it was a, it was actually a very it was a very easy trek that wasn't particularly particularly strenuous, but um, I found it quite tough because I'd not really done anything like that before. And so, yeah, so I was really, really nervous. But having gone on on it, it then it really did boost my confidence and um, and it set me up for for wanting to do more. How old were you when you went on this track, the first track? Uh, I think I was about 32, 33, 32. something like that. I just think it's amazing because I know that there'll be women out there listening right now who, who may be you know, in a similar situation and want to do something like that. But it's actually very scary to take that first step. I mean, can you almost think back to to how you did it or what made you think, do you know what? Yes, I am going to do this. What made you pick, press that submit button? I think it was really just not wanting to spend Christmas on my own. Um, I'm not actually a big Christmas person. And for the past few years, I've actually spent Christmas on my own and I'm quite happy with it. I've got no issue with it. And it's quite nice, actually, just to... Uh, just to have that that peace and quiet, but at that point I'd been with uh, I'd been with David for for twelve years, and we'd always done lots and lots of things together. We'd gone on holidays together, and nothing too too exotic or anything like that. It was usually you know sort of around Scotland, but um, I think it was really I just wanted such a change. Um, once I once I'd split up with him. I just wanted I wanted my life to be very different, just even for a short time. And that's what really sort of pushed me into doing it. And it was just such a big step into the unknown that it felt really, really exciting, absolutely terrifying. But um, I knew it was something that I just had to I had to try. And if I didn't like it, then that was it. You know, nobody was going to force me to go on another trip. Um, But if I did like it, then, you know, great. Because it could open up a whole new world. So Morocco, trekking Morocco, um, Marrakesh, being an assault on the senses, being given your your bag with your toilet roll and matches, you know, very, very different. What was it like out there? I mean, had you done much training or preparation for it? I mean, did you know what to expect or was this a complete unknown? It was a complete unknown. (laughs) I had done no training whatsoever. I didn't know what to expect in the slightest. I didn't at that time the was the internet was not particularly great, so I, I I didn't even I didn't research it or anything. I think I bought I think I bought the Rough Guide to Mor- to Morocco book, which I, I think I glanced through and then never really opened again. But um no, it was um it was great. As I said, it wasn't a particularly strenuous trek, although it felt quite strenuous at the time. And in actual fact the um the there was the British tour leader and there was the Moroccan tour guide. And I'm actually still in contact with the Moroccan tour guide. Um, he started up his own company. So um, some years later, um, I went out and did uh, Mount Tubkal with him. 
And uh, so it's quite nice, actually. You 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 meet people there, and uh, and then you keep in contact with them. And that was just the scenery was spectacular. The people were really nice. Everybody was there for the similar sorts of reasons. And um, yeah, it was it was great. We were right over Christmas. We had a fantastic Christmas dinner. Uh, we had some chickens that had um, gone along the route with us for a little bit, and then obviously they landed on our plates on Christmas Day. And uh, but it was just it was just such a wonderful experience and such a wonderful introduction to trekking. And because it was a, a commercial trek, um, it just I had that peace of mind that if something went wrong, then there were people there that would know what to do and would be able to pick up the pieces. And to be fair, all the stuff that I've done since then has always been on a commercial basis. I haven't really gone off and done very much on, you know, completely on my own. So that's that's something that's perhaps a little bit different from some of the other um, people on the on the podcast. Um, is that you know quite a lot of them are a hell of a lot more adventurous than I am. But um, but yeah, I I like that commercial backup really. Um, and uh, it's, it just gives me a, a sense of uh, confidence. Absolutely. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that at all. And I'm sure you've heard me say this before, but it's it's just not about comparison. It's about doing what works for well, well for you, your lifestyle, what challenges you want to do, you know, what's your what's your comfort zone? How can you stretch your comfort zone, which is what you're doing, but also not, you know, take you so far out of your comfort zone that you're going into 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 panic. So I mean, looking back now, back to back to two, back to um, you know, like the two thousand when it, when you went on this track. I mean, your life has gone a completely different direction. What what do you think you learnt most from having that two week experience out in Morocco? I think I think that I learned that um, I could do without my home comforts, and I actually enjoyed the relative discomfort of um, of being out in the wilderness um, in a tent. And and also it it sort of taught me where my limits were and that my limits were actually uh, a little bit further away than I thought they were because when I started that trek really the it sounds it really does sound silly but the the toileting aspects of it were a real problem for me because I. I just wasn't used to it. And I'm not the sort of person that, you know, sort of can just nip behind a tree al fresco. At that point, I wasn't. By the end of the two weeks, I didn't I didn't care. And uh, it was just such a, it really was such a change around for me. Um, and it, it just showed me that where I thought my limits were, were, yeah, that that was ridiculous, really. And and as I've done more and more, and when we get on to, to talk about some of the more recent stuff that I've done, um, yet again, I discovered that where I thought my limits were, no, I, I broke through those limits um, in spades, really. So, um, so yeah, so I think that's uh, I think that's a, the most important thing that that I, I learned through that. Tell me about another one of your tracks which stands out in your memory. Um, I've done quite a few. I uh, after after that one, I booked up and went to Turkey to uh, trek in the Taurus Mountains. And uh, and yet again, I'd, what happened was um, I actually became a bit of a trekking snob in that every trek that I then done uh, did subsequently, I it was a harder one. It had to be a bit harder and a bit harder, and uh, which is what led me on to mountaineering. But um, one of the most beautiful ones was um, I went to Kazakhstan and uh, we we trekked in the Tian Shan Mountains, which was absolutely stunning. The biggest problem was that my bag uh, didn't turn up at the same time as me. Uh, there was myself and there was another girl who uh, our bags were still at Heathrow. So we didn't see our bags for 10 days. And uh, on the Kazakhstan one, I was with uh, my my boyfriend at the time, uh, another chap. And uh, he'd we, we, we went shopping uh, because the bag wasn't going to turn up until several day, several days later er, at the earliest, and uh, went shopping, got some uh, got some bits and pieces to to tide me over. We borrowed sleeping bag, I borrowed long johns and things from him, and uh, so ten the first ten days were in the Tian Shan Mountains. It's very very alpine, 
absolutely stunning, beautiful, beautiful scenery. And uh, But it got a bit colder as we got a bit higher. And bit by bit, he kept asking for his stuff back. So that was the, that was the thing that told me that that relationship wasn't really going to last. But we then, uh, our bags turned up and the helicopter turned up and took us up to the South Inotrek Glacier. And that was the most amazing place I had ever been to. It was just, it was absolutely surrounded by big white pointy mountains. You've got Cantengri on one side, you've got uh, Peak Pobieda on the other side. We walked out towards Pobieda um, for hours and we never got any closer, it appeared. We then, we walked out uh, towards the Cantengri base camp and it was just, it was just so beautiful there, so remote. The helicopter ride was absolutely amazing. Uh, not long after I got back home from that, the helicopter then crashed. It's a bit of a problem. It does tend to crash. They do tend to crash up there. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. But uh, but it was just an absolute, absolutely amazing trip. And uh, and that that really stood out as as being one of the most amazing places that I'd been to. I mean, it's it's amazing, like the different experiences that you go through. I mean, because some people, you know, not getting your bag, which you've probably spent so much time thinking about your kit, your equipment, what you're going to take, what you're going to need, packed it so carefully, and then not to have access to it while you are in this incredibly remote place must be um, mentally quite d- difficult to handle. Um, yeah. How do you sort of handle those types of challenges while you're out on these treks? Um. I handle them a lot better now than I used to. Um, at first, you just, um, yeah, you mull over it, and uh, and it's just it's just the worst thing in the world that's ever happened to you. Um, I was very very lucky. I was a lot luckier than the other girl in that one because I'd actually, for the first time in my life, I'd actually split packed a little bit. So I had my down jacket, I had my waterproofs and things like that, and one change of clothing in my day sack. Um, she had nothing. So the um, the thing that I've, I found hardest was the sleeping bag that I had. It was borrowed from one of the local companies, and whilst it was it was fine, I knew that somewhere somewhere following us behind was my bag with my sleeping bag, which was a really rusty toasty one. And uh, by the time I got to the end of that ten days, I was actually sleeping in the sleeping bag with everything that I owned was on, and I was still cold. And that was that was quite hard. Shivering there at three o'clock in the morning, thinking, "I wish I had my own sleeping bag." It's not far. I know it's just it's just behind us. I'll see it soon. And uh, yeah, that was that was difficult. But but now you just. After after a bit, you just get to you you learn to to split pack and you you wear your big boots and you make sure that the the vital stuff that you you can't do without is with you on the plane um, and you just you just learn to ex- be a bit more accepting of things and uh, and be a bit better prepared. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, one thing I'd be interested about is on the tracks that you go on. You're obviously you're doing them with with other people, other participants. You know, sometimes with with people you know, sometimes with people that you don't. How does the group dynamics work in terms of of teamwork? I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear more about your experiences with that. Well, it's, it's always been quite interesting. Um, I have always preferred to do these trips on my own. Um, you know, I've, I've had well, that boyfriend that was on the Kazakhstan trip. He was very keen to come on the trips with me. And to be honest, I, I really wasn't that keen because I'm quite a quiet person. And if I've got somebody that I already know, I won't make as much effort with the rest of the, the group to you know sit and chat and things like that. And I think that's quite a common thing. So and also it's from a selfish point of view, it just means that it's somebody else you've got to worry about potentially because he took ill on the couple of trips that he came on and uh and of course you've got to you got to ask how they are and and quite honestly sometimes you don't care how they are <laughs> and uh but um but the group dynamics were very interesting um with the with the earlier trips um you got a very very wide variety of of people and as i said fitness levels and things like that um and you usually found in a group that there was always one or two people that were perhaps a little bit um, different, shall we say, that that didn't really quite gel as well with the rest of the group. 
And if you didn't find any people like that, then you probably found it was yourself that wasn't gelling well. Um, so, but as as time went on and the treks got harder, um, the type of people you got on there was um, it became more focused. So you found that there wasn't quite as big a variety in fitness levels and what people wanted to get out of the trip, um, and that made it a lot easier because then everybody is pretty much single-minded um, and it's, it's much easier to gel together as a team rather than splitting out potentially into little factions of, of people that get on together. Absolutely, I, I can 100% see that. I mean, did you find that your fitness or, or, or what you did fitness-wise when you weren't trekking changed? I mean, did you start going to, going to the gym, doing more walking? You know, how did you maintain your fitness or build up your fitness in preparation for these treks? I started running. I have never been a runner. I um, I really didn't like trying to run at school or anything like that. But um, but no, I started running, and uh, I was only doing I was only doing short distances, and I was I was running with a friend from work, and just doing maybe three miles, four miles, something like that. Um, then I went out to India. I went out to Ladakh and trekked there um, for my fortieth birthday. And once I came back from that, I joined the local running club, the Salisbury Running Club, and and then started doing more and more running. And of course, that helped immensely with the the trekking. My fitness really did get up, and I was doing, um, I was yeah, you know, started doing ten k's, started doing half marathons, started doing marathons, did a couple of uh, ultras, um, and then in two thousand and seven, I did the Everest Marathon. Um, which sounds very grand, but quite honestly, there wasn't a lot of running involved in that one. But uh, but yeah, so that's what I did. I started I started doing a lot of running, so my my fitness got up quite well for the for the the walking uh, the trekking. Do you like running now? Um, not as much as I did, and I uh, partly um, because I'm not very fit at the moment, and I really need to get my finger out a little bit because uh, I've just been a bit lazy. Um, but yeah, I, I'm going to try and get back into the running again and try and try and get my distance up. But I also need to try and get my do a lot of speed work as well because of what I'm doing later on in the year. I need to try and try and improve my fitness a lot. Oh, it sounds interesting. Can't wait to discuss that. But tell us about the Everest Marathon because, like you said, it sounds incredibly glamorous. So, what made you sign up for this challenge? And yeah, tell us more about it. <laughs> Well, the reason why I signed up for it was I'd had far too much wine to drink, and uh, <laughs> and I read I read I read the uh, I read the website and thought, yeah, that sounds. This was round about the sort of Christmas New Year time, and I thought, yeah, that sounds great. I'll uh, I'll apply, and uh, you had to put your your um, your running CV on there, and you had to have had experience in fell running and all this sort of thing, and I'd done yeah you know, sort of bits and pieces here and there. And um, so anyway, so I sent off and I never thought anything more about it because I had another had another two treks coming up. I had a trek to it was uh, it was going to Machu it was in Peru. It was going to Machu Picchu, but it was going not via the Inca Trail, but going um, via Chocoquiro, which was fantastic. That was in May, and then I went back out to Turkey to climb Mount Ararat in uh, the July. And I'd already done a winter sports holiday in Slovenia over the Christmas and New Year. So I thought, I just I just fired and forgot it, really. And then I got the email in saying, congratulations, you've been accepted. And I thought, oh, whoops. <laughs> not, this was the this was going to be in the November. So. Uh, so, yeah, so basically I was just I was just working, saving and uh, and going and or going on treks and, and things like that. So uh, so it was that that year was quite quite busy. And um, yeah, there was my my ex, the the original one that I'd split up with, uh, David. He um, he came out as a marshal for it. And uh, there was I think including the marshals and the runners, there was uh, I think a hundred people, and we were split into three groups, and we trekked for sixteen days. To uh, to get up to Gorak Ship, where the the marathon would begin, and then it ran all the way. It was sold as being um, a downhill marathon. It was not downhill. There are some serious uphills in there. When you get to uh, Tengboshi and Pangboshi, it's, uh, it's that that's definitely not downhill. But um, so you go down to Namche Bazaar, and then because that's only twenty miles, you've got to run out to Tamo and back, 
And that is that was really hard because you could hear all the fast runners getting cheered at the finish line in uh, Namche Bazaar, and you still had another six miles to do. And that was absolutely soul destroying that that one bit. So um so they reckoned on you um doubling your marathon time. Now I'm I'm not a fast runner, so my marathon time is about four and a half, five hours. And they uh, they were absolutely right. The Everest Marathon, it took me, I think it was 10 hours, 14, it took me. Um, a lot of that ended up just walking because it was just either the ground was, the first three miles is a boulder field. So it's it's quite difficult. I'm not great in that sort of ground anyway. And then the uphills were really, really steep. So, um, so yeah, so I just I just basically thought I'll I'll get round it. So I've got my medal, I got my certificate, and uh, I finished it. So, uh, so yeah, so that was something else else to uh, to add to the collection. Incredibly challenging mentally. Not only you know the, the sixteen day hike out there, but you know running through a boulder field. And I've been there as well. In I think it, what happens in London Marathon when you get to the thirteen miler and you turn right from London Bridge to carry on to run to Canary Wharf. On the opposite side of the road, you can see all the faster runners like belt past you and you're thinking you know, they've <laughs> yeah. done like an extra seven miles and they're still bashing it through so, yeah so, so mentally you know running running um very different different environment you know what was going through your head I just wanted it to be over <laughs> no, I, but uh no yet again it was um it was mental fortitude again because um one of the we had uh, with, with the three groups we had uh, basically a leader for each group who they they had been along because it's every two years that it's run and it was just to to guide us and uh, and take us the correct route and things like that because we had to find our own way back um back down to to Namche and uh, and one of the guys there had been trekking in the Annapurna region and had come in with a really really bad cold which he then spread around everybody so the hardest thing about the marathon was actually being fit enough and healthy enough to start it we had doctors um, that came up with us and they um, they did a, a medical on everybody the day before the marathon was due to start to make sure that we were fit enough to start. And there was quite a few people that didn't make it. Um, they got they got pulled because they you know, the chest infections or whatever else. So that was I, I mean, I, I had a really bad cold. And of course, you, you'll know yourself when you get out to altitude, you can't really shift it. It um, it just stays with you, and then of course you get the kumbu cough, and on top of that as well, and uh, it just it just makes it very difficult. So um, so yeah, so it's really just having the the mental strength to just push on. When quite honestly, I could have been doing with just sitting down and saying that's enough. I've uh, I've had enough now, um, and that's that's always the the hardest bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's not just it's not just running, and it's not just tracking. You've also participated in the Plymouth to Dakar charity rally um <laughs> yeah do you, do you want to share a little bit more about what that is um how you came to be involved in it well this was um my uh my boyfriend ian the one that uh, came to kazakhstan he um he's a, he's a very keen rally driver and navigator and uh in actual fact i, I did a little spot of uh, rallying driving um in the endurance rallies with him but he'd um He'd said that you know there was this Plymouth to Dakar um, rally charity event on that he really quite fancied and did a fancy doing it as well. So I thought, oh yeah, why not? And uh, so basically we we drove. I, I managed to get a free car from work. Um, it was somebody who was getting rid of a, an old Citroen BX estate, a 1.4 um, petrol car. Uh, the car had to cost less than a hundred quid, so we got that for free. And uh, and then it would get driven all the way to the Gambia, in actual fact, um, and then auctioned off for charity. And you had to raise money for Gambian charities and you know, a charity of your own choice if you wanted as well. And we had uh, there was another couple of guys in a Land Rover that um, that we already knew from work that were doing it as well. And um, yeah, it was it was superb. It took us it took us three weeks. We left from uh, Portsmouth, and then we drove down. We drove down through France, through Spain, down to uh, Gibraltar, and uh, and then we crossed over to Morocco, and we came down the Atlantic coast route. So we came down through through Morocco uh, into Marrakesh, which I had been to before, obviously, and uh, and then uh, came down through the Western Sahara Protectorate, 
Um, and that uh, DACLA, we then had to cross the border and you had something like 12 or 13 kilometres of uh, minefield to go through before you got to the Mauritanian border at the other side. So there you picked up your, your guide and we had at that point the uh, the, the main road between New Adabu and New Akchot wasn't it was it hadn't met in the middle yet. So you had three days of going across the Sahara Desert. And uh, the first night that we were there, it was um, a howling gale and heaving with rain. So it's it quite, it could almost have been in Britain. And uh, and then we had to, we had another two nights of crossing the desert. And then the final push was uh, first thing in the morning while the tide was out. You had to go and do the beach run to get then finally onto the uh, the road to get down to the, the capital city. And from there, you then went on to um, Senegal, which was beautiful, but they uh, they didn't want us there because we had old cars. Um, and uh, so they assigned a customs officer to us. Uh, we were holed up in, oh, I think for three days in, uh, in a campsite, took a boat up to St. Louis and uh, saw the hotel and the meet me at St. Louis and uh, all this sort of stuff. Um, and then we, we finally, we got escorted by these custom officers um, down to the border and uh, we went across to the Gambia and the president was so uh, welcoming that he allowed us to drive through the presidential arch and uh, our car, Bessie, um, got auctioned off for something like £525, which was uh, we were quite impressed with really. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, it must have been quite a challenging thing to do in terms of being in such a small place with well your boyfriend at the time but that must have been was it difficult like spending that much time with with somebody else um it wasn't too bad actually because we were there was quite a lot of uh, other teams as well so we we were basically i think for our wave there was um because we left on boxing day of 2004 and i think there was something like 30 cars um all leaving in the same at the same time and um, and then we broke into little groups of uh, four cars. So um, so it wasn't too bad. It wasn't that we were we were just stuck together and there was only us. We had other people that um, you know formed part of the community as well. So um, and plus Ian is extremely good with uh, with cars. I wouldn't have wanted to do it with anyone else because he 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 was very good at any problems. We didn't have any problems with our car, fortunately, but uh, some of the others did. And uh, and he was in there with the spanners, you know, sort of helping them out. He's, he's very very good at that sort of thing. So um, so yeah, no, it was it was it was a it was a really good experience, and uh, it was one of the few things that we've done, which uh, obviously wasn't a commercial a commercially run uh, organized uh, trip. So uh, yeah, it was, it was a great experience. Loved it. And talking about mountaineering, you, you know, you've done a, a huge amount of treks all over the world, which is awesome, commercial or not. I, I personally don't think it makes a, a, a difference. Um, tell us about mountaineering and the steps that you took to get into mountaineering and what age that you started doing it. Well, the I, um, I'm trying to think. The, the last thing that I'd done was back in 2009. I did a cycle tour from Lhasa to Kathmandu. I hadn't been doing much in the way of trekking and uh and then i don't know quite what it was that made me think of it but i fancied doing something else so in 2013 i was looking through the uh the adventure um companies uh website and brochures and things like that and i came across a trip to try uh climbing mera and island peak and i thought oh yeah Six and a half thousand meters. I'd been up to. I think I'd been up to five and a half thousand meters or thereabouts up till then, and uh, I thought that sounds really, really good. And it was for. I think it was for about a month. I think it was a thirty-day trip, and I thought, yeah, that sounds really good. So, um, and I thought it's been a long time since I've done anything, so it's about time I, I did something new. So, um, so yeah, so I, I booked up and and off I went. Tell us more. What happened? Well, I um, I managed to summit Mera Peak. Um, it, it, I must admit, uh, this was the this just just second. sorry, just remind everyone where Mera Peak is. Oh, Mera Peak is in Nepal. So this was, I think, the second time I'd been to. I think it was the second time I'd been to Nepal. Um, 
the first time, obviously, for the Everest Marathon. And I thought it was an absolutely fantastic place. Absolutely loved it. And I was really, really keen to go back. But it's oh, actually no third time because obviously I'd cycled from Lhasa to Kathmandu. Um, I'd really, really liked it. Uh, I love the, the people are extremely nice. The the place is just absolutely stunning. So um, and I wanted to I wanted to see how I did at altitude because I'd always been OK up till now. And I said I'd, I'd been up to about five and a half thousand metres and hadn't had any ill effects. So I thought, yeah, push on to something a bit a bit pokier. And um, so, so yeah, so, so Mera Peak was, um, there was a group of six of us with, uh, with the company that I went with. And um, yeah, we all, we all got on really well. And, uh, and we actually had a really good um, summit rate as well, because five out of the six of us actually summited Mera Peak. But it was it was really hard, and uh, I mean that's nearly six and a half thousand meters, which is quite a jump from from five and a half thousand, really. What what made it so hard? Like, could you describe it more? Like, what, what was the, the was it? Yeah, t- just yeah. Sorry, talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> um, the the thing that made it quite hard was uh, was the altitude. It's it is actually quite a big jump to go from five five and a half to to six and a half. Um, the 6,000 meter limit is something that people um, endeavor to get to, to get above um, if they're trying to, to push themselves. Um, they, we were taking our time and uh, and we actually we, we took the long way around so that we had the best chance of acclimatizing. But once you got up to the um, sort of high camp, it was, the the route is quite a long day to get up to the summit, um, and it's it's relatively steep as well. And it just I found that I would I would walk I, I'd be taking a few steps and then I'd have to have a little bit of a rest. And uh, the my friend that I was on uh, the chap that was on the uh, the rope with, he said right count twenty and then you can have a rest, and then count twenty you can have a rest, and uh, and that's the way we did it. Um, so I took. 20 steps and then had a rest. Sometimes I'd push out a little bit more if I was feeling a little bit more um, energetic. And that that's the way we did it. And we actually, we got we got there at a re, you know, sort of quite early in the morning. And then the final push up onto the summit is it's like a big sort of knobble that's on the top of the um, the mountain. So you've got to use your ice axe and, uh, and sort of jumar your way up. And, uh, and yeah, so got up to the top and uh, and yeah it was absolutely amazing but the i think the most amazing part of that trip for me was uh, was a part that was only briefly mentioned in the brochure it wasn't really much said about it and it was crossing the Amphalapsa pass and um i i didn't know what to ex- i i didn't ex- expect anything with that it was just you know we go over a pass and that was it and then i saw it and it is a proper climbing pass, so you're jumaring your way up, um, and you basically get to the top, swing your leg over, and uh, and then you're abseiling back down the other side, pretty much. It's um, it's five thousand eight hundred meters, I think, is uh, is the height you get up to for it, and uh, and it was just absolutely stunning. It really was, and the the views that you get across the way, absolutely amazing, and. Um, and then we went down to Chukung from uh, from there, which was a long, a long, long day to get down there. But you're sitting almost at the base camp. Well, not quite at the base camp, but you're you're sitting there looking out onto Amadablam, which of course is one of the most beautiful mountains that there is in Nepal. It's absolutely stunning. It's it's, it's the Matterhorn of the of Nepal. It is just so beautiful. Um, so. Yeah. With climbing, with with climbing this peak, you know, from obviously from from the language that you've been been using, there's obviously a lot more technical skills involved um, that you wouldn't have needed, obviously, when you were trekking. So, had you yeah. developed your technical skills before you went uh, on the mountaineering, or did you, or did you get to learn them while you were mountaineering? Was that sort of like part of the commercial package? Well, now therein lies a question. I hadn't learned anything before I went. Um, and we're very lucky actually because the um the guy who was our tour leader is a very very good alpinist 
very very good climber and uh, so he taught us how to how to zoom our way up things um, a little bit with the ice axe and things like that but it was after that trip that I realized just how little I knew and I decided then that what I was concerned about was not that necessarily I would be wanting to be striking out and doing stuff on my own because, as I said, I'm not really that adventurous. But what I didn't want to be was in a position where I didn't know whether I was safe or not. And so when I came back from that trip, I enrolled on a course with the International School of Mountaineering out in Lausanne, which had uh, the, the actual course had been recommended to me by a friend of mine who had done it. And uh, and I decided that I wanted to make sure that I had all the skills that I required for doing the mountaineering because I was I had enjoyed it so much. I, I knew that I was going to be doing more of it and I really needed to make sure that I had the skills to to do that because you really do not want to be caught in a position where you don't know how to use your ice axe. You don't know how to walk on crampons effectively you don't know how to zoom our up a, a rope you don't know how to to abseil safely you you really don't want to be in that position at all and I, whilst I wasn't quite in that position I knew that my skills were not at a level that I should really have been um, embarking upon something like that. How did you find the course was it like was it like a weekend course a week-long course a month-long course? It's a uh, it's a week and um, and I've actually I've done several since then. Um, it was the it was a uh, summit and skills four thousand meter course, and basically they teach you all the alpine skills. Uh, it's out in the Swiss Alps, and uh, and at the end you climb a four thousand meter peak. Uh, we climbed the Allerlinhorn, um for that one, and um, and it is very very good in the le- not want to go into a, a huge um, you know sort of advertising campaign or anything, but the level of instruction that you get. Um, is absolutely second to none. The the instructor that I had for that first course that I did was a lady called Julianne Clymer. And um, I didn't realise until afterwards when I then Googled her name just what a climbing pedigree that she has. Uh, she was married to Roger Payne, uh, who unfortunately got killed in the Mont Blanc avalanche in 2012. And uh, But she she had climbed all over the world with him um, they'd made attempts in K2. She was the first non-Russian woman, I think, to um, summit Peak Pobieda um, that I'd seen when I was up in the South Central Czech Glacier. The the sort of stuff that she did was um, was absolutely fantastic, um, and that's the sort of caliber of instructor that they have mm-hmm. there. So it was great. I, I love the fact that you were taught by a woman as well. Yeah, yeah, she she was absolutely superb. And um, and she made things. She she was her instruction was was very very easy to follow, and she kept things nice and simple rather than overcomplicating them. And uh, and she was just she was just so competent as well. She made everything look so easy when she just popped up to put a top rope on for us to you know practice a bit of climbing. And uh, yeah, she was absolutely great. She really was. No, fantastic. I mean, do you, do you find that there's there's many females on the trips that you go on? No, there's not really. Um, when I was on Mera Peak, the um, we kept we we ended up there's there's not many routes up to to Mera Peak. You're all going the same way, and uh, I got friendly with um, a chap called Rolf Ustra and uh, who owns 360 Expeditions, and uh, a girl called Cam, who was climbing Mera Peak with, uh, with them. And, uh, and I've kept in contact with them ever since. And in actual fact, that's who I climbed Troyu with. But, um, but yeah, th- there, was, there, was very, very, there was very, very few um, female mountaineers there. And it was the same when, we, um, when I was in Troyu as well. Our little um, base camp, um, probably had the the best male female ratio of any of the teams. Most of the teams didn't have any females at all. It was it was quite interesting to see. Mm. Disappointing as well, but I love the fact that you had sort of um, more or less sort of equal numbers. But let's talk about Tibet and the first of October, twenty sixteen, when you became yeah. the oldest British woman to climb Choyoyo. Yeah. If I'm saying it right, so 
I mean, massive congratulations. And incredible. Thank you. Tell us, first of all, just tell us a little bit more about the mountain, its height, location, etc. Well, it's, uh, it straddles the border of Nepal and Tibet. And it's, uh, depending on what source you look at, it's, it's, it's the sixth highest mountain in the world. And, uh, and it's 8,201 metres, although sometimes you'll see it as 8,188. But I, I go for the, the 8,201 metres. That's, that's I, a better one. I, I would as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, it was what happened. The, the re- well, I'll tell you the reason why I actually decided to do it was I was, um, I was, ca- I was going to be it was a year before I was going to turn 50. And uh, I thought to myself, I really fancy doing something quite special. And I didn't really quite know what. And round about the same time, um, a good friend of mine, um, who I used to work with years ago when I was still up in Scotland, um, at the age of 43, got diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. And um, and it was so sudden. Um, he's still living. He's, he's still he's, he's he's fine, and the treatment has uh, has you know sort of worked very well for him so far. But um, but it just it just hit me that he was you know there he was you know one minute he was fine, the next minute he was given this terminal sentence, and I thought if I'm going to do something big, I need to just you know throw caution to the wind and just go for it. And so I booked up Cho Are You. Um, and uh, so it was about 18, 18 months in advance or thereabouts. And uh, and it also it took me that long to actually pay for it as well, because uh, 8,000 metre peaks are not cheap. And um, so, so yeah, I, 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 I was interested in, I wanted to go back to Nepal anyway and um, and spend a bit of time there. But you, you actually, you climb the mountain from the Tibet side, the Nepal side, oh good God, that looks like you know north face of the Eiger, except a lot bigger. So that that wasn't a gore. But the commercial expeditions go from the Tibet side, and um, because the friendship highway and uh, bridge had got damaged um, in the uh, 2015 uh, earthquake, then the road had only just been reopened, but not for foreigners. So instead of driving the, I don't know. 50 miles or whatever it is as the crow flies from uh, Kathmandu to to the base camp at uh, Chuoyu. Uh, we had to fly up to Lhasa and then drive um, via Shigatse, Tingri, and then finally get to Chuoyu. So it ended up taking about a week, I think, to to get to, to the base camp. But um, but it was quite nice doing that because we, we visited places that I'd visited in 2009 and that was interesting to see how much change there had been. Um, for instance, Lhasa was Lhasa was a big city when I was there in 2009, but it is huge now in comparison. And the same with Shigatse and even Tingri, which was um, was not really a place that I uh, relished going back to. It um, it's improved quite a lot, and there's been a lot of uh, investment, and there's a lot of building work going on. They've built a new school, they've built new hotels. Um, people don't get sick when they go there, um, that sort of thing. So, um, so it was quite nice to to be able to sort of take our time, and of course you're acclimatising gently because I think Tingri is about four thousand six hundred or thereabouts. So you're you're building up a bit of um, altitude uh, as you're going, and then. You go to you drive out to the Chinese base camp, um, and then you 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 then have to start walking. Uh, so you walk up to an interim camp called Noodle Camp, and then you walk from there up to Advanced Base Camp or ABC, and that's where you spend most of the six weeks that you're on the mountain. Um, and that's that's probably that's probably one of the the hardest things is. Um, you have to have a lot of patience and you have to be quite happy to just sit around and rest an awful lot. What was it like just, you know, summit night and, and heading up there being over 8,000 metres? Well, I I struggled with acclimatisation and it took me two attempts to get to Camp 1 and it took me two attempts to get to Camp 2. And quite honestly, by the time I got to to that stage I was thinking I am not sure that this is going to happen for me and um but I got up to camp two anyway and uh and all the rest of the team were there and they were going to go for their summit push that night um 
So off off they went anyway. And uh, so the following, so I got a good night's sleep there. And the following day, um, when you're at that sort of height, then all you're doing is just melting snow for water. So that you spend your whole, you spend days doing that. And um, so I just busied myself and just rested. And um, and then the others came back about mid-afternoon or thereabouts. And I thought, I'm, I'm still not sure that I'm going to make the summit. But um, the Rolf, um, he, he, he'd summited with the, the rest of the team um, that day. And so had uh, Padawa, uh, one of our, uh, Sherp- our climbing Sherpas. We had we'd five fantastic climbing Sherpas. They've got something like 56 Everest summits between them. Absolutely amazing. They are uh, they're absolutely fantastic. Um, but Rolf and Padawa, they got out of their beds um, to give me the chance of a summit. Um, so basically, I got up at any point. I could, I could have, I could almost have just said, "That's it. I'm just, you know, I'm not doing it." But I, I reckon that um, I owed it to both myself and to them that if I could actually stand on my feet and move one foot in front of the other, no matter how slowly, that I was going to give it everything. As long as I could, as long as I could stay on my feet, then I would, I would keep going, and that's what I did. Um, and at one point, I, I just I found that I was taking you know, a few steps and then I was having to rest and then a few more steps and having to rest. And um, and I apologised to Rolf saying, I am so sorry that I am so slow. And he said, well, actually, you're doing not too badly. So so that was a, a bit of a, a lift. Um, and of course, you're you're climbing through the through the night. And uh, one of the first obstacles that you get to from on your summit push is um, the yellow band, which is just above Camp Three, and it's uh, it's basically sort of mixed rock, ice, and snow. Um, and you're on fixed ropes the whole time, so you're you're holding yourself up with a jumar. And I got to I, I don't know quite what happened, but I sort of got to a point where I, I sort of paused, and then I couldn't really get started again. And then Padawa shouted at me, and I scampered up the rest of the the rest of the yellow band uh, quite quickly. So it obviously it obviously worked. And uh, and it was just a plod. It really was just, it was so steep and it was just an absolute slog. And then you get to, I mean, I knew there was a false summit, so uh, that wasn't a surprise. But you get to, you get to the end of all the steep bits. Um, you see the false summit and you think, yeah, it looks like you should be going there. But it's a plateau. It's a huge plateau. And this is where the final one metre is actually the hardest of the lot because it's um, it's a very, very long final final push and uh and then eventually you get to the far end you see all the prayer flags and you look out and if you've got reasonable visibility you see everest lotse and nuptse and you get your photograph taken with those in the background so that you can show your proof to the himalayan database and um and it was just such a feeling of uh, of satisfaction and i was absolutely thrilled um I have got no pictures whatsoever of me without the oxygen mask on, so there's no proof that it was actually me that was un- under that oxygen mask. But it was just such a feeling. Um, I just couldn't believe that I'd actually got there. Um, and then, of course, I had to get back down, which was a whole other story. So, but uh, yeah, it's fab- absolutely fantastic. Amazing. And so you were 50 when you did that. I was, yes, yeah. Fit- I was going to say, it's, it's, it's just like evolution, isn't it? You know, from, from your early 30s when you started out to heading to India on in your 40th carry on trekking to climbing Choy- Choyoyu, you know, the sixth highest mountain in the world, 8,201 meters, um, and, and doing it and getting that sense of satisfaction. I mean, absolutely amazing. I mean, mm. w- when you look back now, do you have like different recollections or, or like how is it, has it changed your life in any way? It has, um, in the respect that, uh, well, the first thing is that I still can't believe that I actually did it is one thing, but I do have photographs to prove it. Um, and um, and the, the the camaraderie of the team as well. Um, we got, I mean, spending six weeks with the same group of people, we had, there was five of us in our little team. There was four um, uh, folk, they're, they're all German speakers, there was an Austrian, a Swiss guy, uh, two German women, and then uh, there was another little group of of three. 
it's still quite a, a small number of people to be spending that amount of time with. And uh, fortunately, we all got on really well. So the camaraderie was really good and everybody was ever so supportive as well. And um, and everybody, even, even the other teams, um, everybody was really friendly. And you got some seriously accomplished mountaineers there. Uh, we ran into, you know, a, a Dutch pair of guys that... Um, you know, they they climbed K2. They yeah, they've done the north face of the Eiger, and they were as thrilled as we were. You know, at the fact that we managed to to summit, um, and there was no there was no ego or anything like that. Everybody was just incredibly supportive and very very pleased for for the people who summited, and it, it was absolutely absolutely amazing. Um, so the the other the other thing that really changed i think was um going back to the knowing your limits i thought that i knew my limits and uh, it turns out that i really didn't at all because my limits were somewhere off in the middle distance um compared to what i thought they were because that that summit um push that was the it's the hardest thing that i've ever had to do and when when they say that, you know, like mountaineering and a lot of things are, you know, sort of 80 percent mental attitude, it's absolutely right. It really is because, you know, physically I wasn't I, I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't fit enough in retrospect. Um, but the mental fortitude was the thing that pulled me through. And obviously the the help of the of Rolf and Padawa, you know, sort of in getting me up and back down safely. Um, it's just that is the thing that you just go smashing through what you thought your limits were there yeah you, you it's very very difficult to see just what you can do when you really put your mind to it what's next for you well next is um in october this year i'm going to attempt ama de blam tell us so, more where's ama de blam well ama de blam is that beautiful mountain that i saw when i was in chukung in uh in nepal um, when I did the Mera and Island Peak, and uh, I've been looking at it, you know, so, since since the first time that I went out to Nepal, I've looked at it and I thought that is so beautiful, I would love to do it. And uh, I came back off of Chowayu and basically booked it up as soon as I got back. And uh, yeah, so it's not as high; it's just under seven thousand meters, um, but it's a lot harder. It's a lot more technical. So, um, so I've done I've done a few more alpine courses. I did the uh, I redid my summits and skills, and I did the technical alpine course, and I did the technical alpine course, and all this sort of thing. So, you know, my my skills are are, are a bit improved now in what they were. And um, and I went out to I was out in Greenland in uh, August as well, which was superb. Um, so out in very remote area and climbing climbing peaks that. Uh, well, unfortunately, they weren't unclimbed peaks. We got we got beaten by a crowd of Italians in 1969. Uh, but um, but yeah, climbing climbing very remote peaks that most people haven't been up. And uh, and yeah, so that was that all added to my skill set as well. You know, sort of route finding and uh, and climbing up some really sort of quite quite loose loose rock and making sure you don't uh, kill kill your compatriots in the process so um yeah it's, it's it's i'm really really looking forward to it but i keep thinking it's just it's such a it's such a big undertaking i just hope that i haven't bitten off more than i can chew well let's let's not even go there <laughs> <laughs> so this is what you've got to get a fit for yeah absolutely and i'm doing it again with uh, my friend cam and uh so uh so that should be really good and with rolf so um so yeah so the dream team will be back together again and uh and hopefully hopefully we'll have a a fair old bash at it anyway so when are you starting your training when are you going to be putting your trainers on getting back up running probably next weekend i need to i've got a, i've got an assignment for the open university that i need to get in for for next weekend so once i've got that out the way then I'll get the trainers on and uh, and get cracking. But I do I do train twice a week anyway. I've got a personal trainer that, um, in actual fact, it's the same personal trainer that Joe Bradshaw um, has. She recommended me uh, recommended him to me, and um, so I've been training with him uh, since before going to Cho Oyu and since coming back. 
So um, so I still train twice a week with him for the sort of strength strength training mostly. Um, so I'm, I'm still keeping keeping up some. It's just the cardio that I need to really sort of get under control a bit at the moment. Yeah, do you know that was actually going to be my next question. Do you know do you figure out training plans yourself, or do you work with 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 a you know a professional to help you with with everything you need to do? So that must take quite a lot of pressure off you actually not necessarily having to plan your training and just sort of being able to leave it to somebody else who's experienced at training, um, you know, female climbers. Yeah, that it does help a lot actually. And, um, I trained, I trained with Matt for 10 weeks before going to try you and he made such a difference to me. And at that point I was training one-on-one. Um, now I'm training, uh, with some other people as well, because it helps to keep the costs down a little bit. But we've still got our own programs, and um, yeah, so he he tailors my training towards um, the the mountaineering aspect. So uh, the number of squats that I end up doing is ridiculous, really. Um, but yeah, so he's um, he he's he's been looking after my training in in that respect, and uh, it does make a big difference because other than that, I I sort of go to the gym and then sort of flounder around and do a bit of this and do a bit of that and uh, I find it very difficult to sort of structure myself and um, so having him just you know say right this is what you're doing and uh, right crack on and uh, and he he does crack the the whip so in that 30 minute session I do more there than I would do if I was doing an hour in the gym myself so it really is worth every penny. I mean what you've done over, over the past um past couple of decades is absolutely amazing and just so inspiring that you've, that you've gone out there and done it from all your experiences you know what advice and tips would you have for other women who maybe are scared of stepping outside their comfort zone and doing things you know uh, alone you know what what advice would you have um I think my advice would be um as I said I've I've always gone down the commercial route because I like that safety net really um I wouldn't mind doing some stuff that's um, that's perhaps uh, you know sort of self self contained at some point, but my advice would be to to have a look at commercial commercial expeditions or treks. Um, a lot of them with the the sort of the, the well known companies, they they do attract the you know sort of people in a similar sort of boat. So you get people that are single or perhaps are just you know are divorced or separated or and as I said, the odd the odd couple here and there as well. Um, and just just give it a go. Pick something that is perhaps you know sort of in your comfort zone with a, a trek that perhaps is not too um, too strenuous. Uh, you know, unless unless you you know you feel that you can you can do something um, something more. But just to get into the swing of things and perhaps see how you like camping, for instance, if you've not done it before. Um, the hardest bit is actually just taking that leap and, as you say, pressing that submit button. Um, but if you do it for maybe a week, then, you know, most people can get through things for a week. And if you absolutely hate it, it's not the end of the world. You perhaps look and see what else there is to, to do. Um, uh, you might find, like me, that you absolutely love it and uh, and you just go on to bigger and bigger things and uh, have to earn more and more money to try and spend on these bigger and bigger things i was gonna say i mean do you get a sponsorship or anything to help fund these trips how, how do you pay for it all <laughs> i just save up no i don't i don't get sponsorship i i did i did wonder about sort of looking at that sort of route but there's the, the couple of reasons why not one is that um, there's not many people that will sponsor you for doing commercial expeditions um most of the grants that you can get it's you know if you're actually going to be um, doing stuff and organising stuff on your own, they they don't they don't give you a grant for doing commercial stuff. Um, and the other thing is as well that um, I I've got a real dislike of feeling as if I'm beholden to anyone, so I much prefer to actually just you know spend my own money. Um, and it's the same with my Open University course as well. I could get work to pay for it, but um, I'd rather not. I've just paid for that myself because it's something that I wanted to do. And uh, and if I wanted to give up at any time, then I I don't have to I don't have to go back to work and say, oh well, I want to give up the course that you've uh, paid for me. Um, so 
so yeah, I, I prefer just to be self sufficient and and do things on my own. But but you know that's that's not for everyone. And and if anyone was to to offer to you know give me a couple of uh, black diamond fusion ice axes, which I used for the Used for the first time a couple of weeks ago and uh, did a bit of ice climbing in Norway. I fell in love with the axes. Then, yeah, I'd be I'd be quite happy to take to take those. But um, yeah, I I I, I haven't I have not really thought about the the sponsorship route because I don't uh, I prefer just to to pay for it myself. No, and good for you. And I love the fact that you found your your passion, your interest, and actually you know you save up for these trips because you want to go and do them. You want to challenge yourself push yourself to the limit and stretch out those comfort zones and see what you can learn from the experience yeah Charlene are you on social media is there anywhere where people can follow along with your um, challenges and adventures I am on social media I'm not very good at updating it um, I'm on Facebook under my own name Charlene Gibson um, I also started up a page called The Accidental Mountaineer, but um, I've been quite bad at keeping that up to date. Charlene, thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast to share more of your story and the journey that you've been on from trekking to mountaineering to becoming the oldest British woman to climb Choi Oyu. Absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate you sharing um, your journey with us. That's all right. Thank you very much for having me. I, as I said, I wasn't sure you know, whether whether my story would be of interest, but um hopefully if it if it encourages somebody to um to just take that leap and do something that they've they perhaps always always fancied doing but never quite had the courage to do, um, then it's it's well worth it. Mount mountaineering is the only thing I think that I've done that I've actually been I've done for myself because every other hobby that I've had it's always been because, you know, there's a friend has done it, a boyfriend has done it, and I've always just sort of ended up falling into things that way. But mountaineering is something that I have done purely for myself, and it feels great. And, you know, I, I know 100% that you will have inspired people listening to actually to do their next challenge, whether it's trekking, mountaineering, running, cycling, whatever it is, just to get out there and to give things a go. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully. Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Charlene and it's encouraged you to sign up for that trip, to go on that trek and to go and climb that mountain. Whatever your passions are, just get out there and get after it. If you want to be inspired by even more women, then take a look at toughgirlchallenges.com where you can find details of the other 150 plus women that I've interviewed over the past three years. Mountaineers, explorers, runners, swimmers, triathletes. Um, there is such a different array of women that I've interviewed all with inspirational stories and top tips and tricks that you can learn and apply to your own life. My one request for you today is to tell one person about the Tough Girl podcast, a friend, a work colleague, somebody you run with, a random person you're sat next to on the train or on the bus. Just tell them about the Tough Girl podcast and inspire them to take a listen and hopefully it'll encourage them to get after their own personal challenges and goals. A big thank you to all my patrons, my financial supporters and backers who support me every single single month by donating $5 a month, $10 a month, $15 a month, $20 a month or $25 a month. You can go even higher than that. There is no limit on how much you can donate. But what that does is it allows me to fund the running costs of the podcast so that I can get these episodes out for you so you can listen to them every single week, every Tuesday when new episodes of the Tough Girl podcast come out at 7am UK time. Be part of the mission and get involved and see what rewards you can get from becoming a patron. Go and check out Patreon, P com forward slash tough girl podcast. I really do appreciate it. I'm trying to reach 250 patrons. Um, sign up, become one of them. It would be awesome. All right, guys, have an awesome day wherever you are, whatever you are doing. Just get out there, smash it, have some fun. Go and challenge yourself. Just step outside of your comfort zone. Do something different. Do something new. Do something exciting. All right, take care and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.